hallelujah. Uh, we're going to start, uh, I guess we already started this kind of this past Sunday, but uh, we're going to study uh, the book of Judges for today, um, every Wednesday. And I'm thinking we will take it uh, little by little, uh, not too much at a time. Uh, Genesis, we want to cut a bit at a time. Uh, but uh, Judges, I think, uh, you can think of it as like a war, war drama, uh, and, and it'll get uh, quite exciting. And I think it's one of the books that we often uh, just kind of skip or just don't read it that much. And, but there's so much in it. And today uh, the passage was quite a little bit uh, confusing because we started from the end of Joshua chapter 24. <clears throat> and went all the way to Judges chapter 1. And uh, I did that to show us the transition, uh, the difference between Joshua and Judges. And the book of Judges is uh, telling us a story about what the Israelites did after the 40 years of wilderness journey and the 16 years of the conquest war. And finally they're settling down within this quote unquote promised land that God had uh, promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and the Israelites had been longing to come back to this land and finally they came in and they're, they're living there and uh, what happened and uh, what is happening and what was actually in this land of Canaan Canaan and uh, this is not just a land, uh, just a promised land, but it was a, uh, it's a land, as we learned, that represents uh, the promised land, the, the, the land of blessings. For us, it, it, it even extends to, to apply to us as the restored Garden of Eden, the, the Garden of Eden that, we, that needs to be restored, and the land that we, are about, we want to get into. However, this land on this earth, in this history, was influenced and deeply rooted with Canaanite culture. Do you remember the Canaanite culture from Genesis chapter 6, Genesis chapter 10, the Nimrods, the, the Anakites, the people that were so corrupt, the people that were standing against God, People who are heroes against God. These are the people that used, that started to live in this land. And, and to the very soil, it was enriched with the Canaanite culture. Canaanite religion, Canaanite beliefs, ideologies, ways of life. And for the Israelites to go in and not be influenced by that, or will they be influenced by that? That, it, that was a big, big question. How, how will the Israelites, let's say they conquer the land, they become the owners of the land, but will they conquer the mines? Or will, will their mines be conquered? And as we think about this, we can apply this to ourselves as we live in this world. And we know that Canaan was a son that was cursed by Noah when, uh, because of, of what Ham did. And so, from there, we, we can see that the, the root of Canaan was not so pure and clean. It, was, it began with a curse. And as I mentioned uh, on the Lord's Day, uh, Judges chapters 1 and 2 are basically an introduction. It, it leads us into this, this uh, life of during the time of the Judges. And chapters 1 and 2 basically show us the conquest, how the, the different tribes fought to conquer the land. And so they were given allotted places, they were allotted different portions of the land, and they were supposed to go out each of the tribes to conquer their own region. And 
how that happens, we will study uh, next week. But one thing that is emphasized in today's passage, we read from Joshua chapter 24, verse 29. So we will go back to Joshua 24, 29. But before that, let us uh, read Judges chapter 1, verse 1. The very beginning of this book, what does it say? Now it came about after the death of Joshua that the sons of Israel inquired of the Lord, saying, Who shall go up first for, uh, for, uh, go up for, uh, for us against the Canaanites to fight against them? What kind of feeling do you get when you... When you're starting a book, starting a, a new, new chapter, and it starts with this, it came about after the death of Joshua. Plus, a positive or negative? Negative. Not so good. It speaks, starts with the death, t- talking about the death of a great leader that led them into that land. And then the question, who shall go up first for us against the Canaanites to fight against them? Positive or negative? Do they, do they sound like they know what, what they're doing? Or do they sound like they're confused and lost and without leadership? And so that's, that's the very opening of Judges. But right before that, we read Joshua chapter 24 of 29. It says, It came about after these things that Joshua, the, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died being 110 years old. Again, in Judges chapter 2, verse 8, it says, Joshua the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. Do you get the point here? The author of the Judges, and from Joshua, basically God is emphasizing one thing here. What do you think? Take a wild guess. I just read three verses that says, after these things, Joshua died. It's a big event. It's a big deal here. For the Israelites, it's a traumatic event. And because Joshua wasn't there, they didn't know who was to go up first, who who was to do what. This is beginning. And and when it says, now it came about after, this phrase is often used in the Old Testament. Now it came about after such and such event or such and such thing. Okay. What happened? What, what, after what? Okay. Joshua 24, 29, it says, Now it came about after. After what? After the death of Joshua. But then, right before what happened, okay. what happened was, Joshua uh, made a, a covenant at Shechem. And he was asking the people, are you going to worship idols or are you going to worship our God? So he made them swear, basically swear, make a covenant saying, we will worship God and we will not worship idols. But when it says, now it came about after, now it came about, this phrase is uh, like a... A marker for a new chapter of story. Basically he's saying, all these things, the, the conquest of Canaan, they came into Canaan, all these thing, things happened with Joshua, and now after he died, a new chapter, a new era begins. So Judges is introducing a new era after the death of Joshua. Some people's death might not be so significant, but there are people in our life or in our history whose death becomes very significant and makes a big, very big difference in an organization, in a church, or in history and a nation. Right? And after the death of that person, that nation or organization can flourish or even perish. There's a big difference. And the death of Joshua was a big, big, big event for the Israelites. Why? Because Moses died not too long ago, right? Probably less than 20 years ago, Moses died. 
And Joshua took over. And he thought Joshua would lead us into the land of Canaan and allow us to help us conquer, lead us in the conquest. And after all that conquest, finally, under this leadership, we will establish a nation in this land and we'll continue on. But then, out of their expectation, he just died. All of a sudden. And not all of a sudden. It was according to God's plan, but he died. For the people, they, weren't probably, they probably were not ready for the death of Joshua. And so, now they have to set up a nation, basically. They have to come, finish the conquest. And they have to settle down, and they have to start living. This is the real deal. They now have to start living. It's kind of like you, if, uh, we, as we grow up, we are in the teens, and you kind of expect, you know, after I go to university, graduate, get a proper job, then I will, I will come out of the house and become independent. But then, when I'm 16, all of a sudden my parents die. And now I, I need to get out in the, in the world and actually hit the ground and, and live my life. Make a living. It's kind of like that kind of feeling. Joshua, and Judges chapter 1 begins like that. But guess what? Joshua chapter 1 verse 1. Let us turn to Joshua 1.1. 1, 1. Now it came about, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' servant, saying, Joshua chapter 1 begins with the death of the previous leader. And Judges begins, but what's the difference? In Joshua, after Moses died, God appointed one specific leader and said to Joshua, the son of Nun, saying this and this, do this. But in Judges, there is no successor. There is no successor. It's, it seems like God forgot to appoint another one. And so people are feeling very lost. And, and so Joshua chapter 1 begins with the death of Moses, but then Joshua is there. People can depend on him. And then throughout the entire book of Joshua, you see Joshua, uh, God speaking to Joshua, God working with Joshua, and Joshua leading the people. For almost, it seems like almost better than Moses, Joshua, what he did. He was a new leader, very radical, very powerful. He was out there fighting on, uh, with the people. It was good. And Joshua 24, verse 31, it says, Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who survived Joshua and had known all the deeds of the Lord which he had done for Israel. That's the last verse, uh, 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 towards the last uh, part of Joshua. And it concludes that during the time of Joshua, People remember to serve the Lord. Again, Joshua uh, Judges chapter two verse seven also says, Judges two seven, the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua, all and all the days of the elders who survived Joshua. Right. But that's about it. It ends there, and then. At the end of Joshua, Joshua ch chapter 24, another thing happens. Anybody know? After Joshua dies, what do they do? They had been carrying the bones of Joseph, right? And they finally buried the bones of Joseph. This is in Joshua 24, verse 31, uh, 32. What do you feel like? Joshua dies. 
Joseph's bones are buried. What do the people have now? Of course, the bones are, of Joseph are supposed to be buried, but then once, they're, once the bones are buried, they don't have a physical icon, the physical reminder for them to remember the covenant. When the bones, when they were carrying the bones, the bones were the reminder. Remember, the bones, bones of Joseph, we learn in, in the second book, but who carried them out? Moses carried them out. The bones of Joseph is about remembering. Remember the days of old. Re Joseph remembered, and he said, when you go out, remember my bones. And Moses remembered to carry them out. And it was a reminder for people, every time they looked at the bones of, or the casket of both, uh, Joseph, they were reminded, as Joseph said, God will be good and take us into the land of Canaan. But now that reminder was buried. So the leader is dead, the reminder is buried, and so they, they are not it is very who it is who need, who is in charge now? Who is responsible for continuing this covenant? It feels like it just came to a, an abrupt end in this flow of the genealogy of the covenant. Let me ask you: Is that what we feel like? Sometimes it's kind of depressing to to look at uh, and, or hear about the churches in Europe, churches in the U.S. Now some of the churches in Korea, many churches all around the world. Who cannot the churches where they cannot continue with the next generation? And we hear oftentimes through Pastor Philip Lee also that he's been to Europe uh, and different churches and in the, United, in the United States only older generation remains what Satan is trying to do in our history of church is to cut off this flow how about, how, how about your gener our generation if we have young people here, how about your generation? Who's going to continue on? To be honest, uh, to be honest, our mindsets, our mentality, our attitudes, I, when I say our, I'm speaking for my own self, is, I'm, I'm, I'm comparing this to trying to apply it to my life. Uh, how people would have felt when Joshua passed away. First, when Moses passed away, but then Joshua was there, after Joshua passed away. And I was thinking about when uh, our senior pastor, Reverend Abraham Park, passed away. Was it good or bad? Is that a bad question? <laughs> Let me dare to tell you, being honest, honest to my bones. My physical body said it's more comfortable. Why? Because I don't have to be afraid anymore. Because I don't have to think about somebody yelling at my back or on my face anymore. I don't have to worry about, oh, I have to wake up 4 o'clock every morning anymore. The person that, the scary, the scary person that used to hold my head up is gone, right? But then what comes as a result? Follows. Some of the standards go down and break down my life 
And soon, even my faith standard goes down. And soon, even my, my you know, uh, some of the things that are not supposed to be, it's kind of, kind of become very flexible. And soon, it's like, oh, maybe it's okay now. And I think, I'm thinking, from my, my personal experience, maybe in, during the time of the judges after Joshua passed away, maybe people kind of uh, felt like, oh wow, we can breathe a little bit now. But then, what God wanted to see fulfilled was not being done. Please forgive me if I was blasphemy. But I'm just I'm just saying. What was the Israelites like? That's what exactly what they what happened. They became rubber band faith. When they needed, when they needed so they, they, their, their standards came down and they were like flexible here and there and that invites all kinds of darkness and attacks. So they got into trouble. What happens when you get into trouble? What would you do when you get into trouble? When more problems come in your way, you realize, oh my God, what have I done? So you repent and you come to pray again. And then God sends a judge. Let us turn to Judges 2, 18 and 19. Judges 2, 18 and 19. When the Lord raised up judges for them, the Lord was with the judge and delivered them from the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For the Lord was moved to pity See, the Lord was moved to pity by their groaning because of those who oppressed and afflicted them. But it came about when the judge died, that they would turn back and act more corruptly than their fathers. In following other gods to serve them and bow down to them, they did not abandon their practices or their stubborn ways. What's going on? When they're in trouble, when they're being attacked, they cry out, God says, judges. During the time of the judges, they're okay because the judge is praying for them and they're okay. they're, they're, there's somebody who's, who's holding them. But then as soon as the judges are, are done or their time is over, they go right back. It's kind of like rubber band. There's a, you hold a rubber band in one hand and you pull the other hand. And you let go, what, what does the, the rubber band do? It goes right back. The center force of that rubber band holding force was not in the holiness, but it was in the sinfulness. And so it was a temporary godliness or holiness. Only when they were in trouble, only when they needed God, only when the judges were there, they were acting holy or, or coming to pray and, and all that. But then when things were became okay and became more comfortable, pew, right back. Right back to to their idolatry, serving other gods. And so it wasn't like the times of Joshua where they continued on serving the Lord. It was on and off, on and off. There was no continuity. There's, it was segments of time when they temporarily worshipped God and served God. And that's what I want us to think about as we think about our lives today. Is my life continuous serving God or is it, seg is it segmented? Is it just temporary and then when trouble comes I come back to God when it becomes comfortable, I go away and come back. And they, one thing that these people blamed, or one reason they 
said was, it's because of the lack of a leader. Who's the, who are they blaming? They said because there was no king. Our life is like this. Because there is no king. Who are they blaming? They're blaming God. God, you did not appoint another leader. That's why so much trouble. But look, God is saying to Judah in today's passage, Judges chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. Judges chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. The Lord said, Judah, Shagawah, behold, I have given the land into your hand. He's telling, he's now telling each tribe to go up. You have to know the times. Let us rewind back and think about the time of Abraham. Time of Abraham was, he was, he was the only one basically believing in God. He was a soul starter, he was a pioneer. And so he needed to, God needed to start this sparkle, this spark of, of faith. So he needed to find somebody who can, who can respond to God's calling of faith. And, and that was Abraham, that one soul, one man. And so Abraham, during the time of Abraham, this fight, the struggle, and, and the task was to get out of the, the sinful ways and sinful place and receive God's calling and respond to God's calling by getting up and moving out. During the time of Isaac, it was Isaac's task was to inherit the father's faith and carry it on through, through faith and obedience. So Isaac represents, uh, Abram is the one who received it, but Isaac is the, the link to the, to the following generations. Although Isaac did not receive it, especially uh, Genesis chapter 22 incident, the Mount Moriah incident, although Isaac did not receive it from God directly, he had enough, good enough faith to be able to obey. So he, carried, he became a link. And as a result, Jacob, during the time of Jacob, he had to fight. He, he had to believe in this covenant so strongly and, and firmly that he needed to, to sacrifice his entire life, basically, to fight for this covenant. And you can see growth. You can see a lot of pain and a lot of struggle in Jacob's life. But through that struggle and pain, he grows. And not only does his faith grow, but God expands through these three generations. God expands this from one person, Abraham, to a family. A big family. And then he calls it, calls it Jacob, Israel, you'll be a nation. Just as... He promised it, Abraham. And so it, is expand, it has expanded from one man to one family to one nation. And then Joseph is a generation of fulfillment. He's the one that will become the fruit. He's the one that needs to go to the land of Canaan through faith. But Joseph, Joseph was through faith, but it is through Moses that that faith was fulfilled. So Moses was the, the activator. Moses was the carrier of that, that faith. Literally, he carried the bones of Joseph. During the time of Joshua, he was summing up this entire journey. Joshua was the last one to, to bring the people into the land of Canaan. Now then, what about the times of the judges? Is the history of redemption over now? Has it come to an end? Is it completely fulfilled? 
And so, from Abraham to Joshua, is there was some kind of common theme going on, and like it's like a pun passed down to one one generation after another. But it seems like after Joshua, the baton is gone. Where is it? There are a few places in the Bible that, that happens. Similarly, when the Ark of the Covenant disappeared, and so they used to follow the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Covenant was the center of worship, representing God's presence, and it disappeared. Now what do we follow? Where is God? So what do the people do? What are they supposed to do? What's, what's God requiring of them in this time? It was a time when God did not appoint one leader, but it was a time when they were supposed to be more mature. And each tribe goes out to represent. Each tribe needs to be like Joshua now. Each of us, each of our branch churches, or each of our local churches, need to now take up the, you know, in, in a war, there's a, uh, what do you call it, uh, a, a soldier that always carries the banner, right, For, to represent, to the what, what flag, flag, what do you call it, signal, flag, banner. If that banner falls, that team lost, that team. That nation has lost a battle. So, when I see movies, when you, I haven't been in a, in a battle, but when I see movies, when the guy that is carrying the flag falls, the next guy has to pick up the flag and go. Right? Even if they get shot or they, they die, they protect the flag, the national flag. Likewise, who is the one to pick up that flag now? Everybody during the time of judge, judges, they were saying, who's going to pick up the flag? That was the question Judah was, they were asking, who's going to go up? Who's, Joshua, Joshua was carrying the flag, he, he fell now, he died. Who's the next one? And right now, is the flag down on the ground? In this history of redemption movement, or in this generation of Christianity. Think about in Singapore, is the flag up and high, lifted up, and are we marching on, or is the flag down on the ground? If it is, who is the one to pick it up? Everybody is kind of avoiding it and looking around, who's the leader? And God is saying, during the time of the judges, every tribe pick up your flag. And now go to your places and start representing the people of God. And every tribe needs to show and be a proof that God is better than the Canaanites. Just as God promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob through Joshua and Caleb, God kept on saying, I will destroy the Canaanites for you. And it is the tribe that needs to go and fulfill that. It's not fulfilled yet. They need to go up and do it. There's no more excuses. We are grown-ups. Right? Just like the example that I mentioned earlier. If the parents pass away early without preparing the kids, the first brother or uh, the, every, every uh, child needs to wake up and realize the ones got, you don't have the parents to go out and earn money for you. That means you have to wake up and get up and go out there and do something. And that's how Judges begins. Kind of like they felt like they became orphans. But God is saying, Judah, go up. You go up first. You're the, you're the tribe of the king. Royal tribe. And you're the big tribe. And so you need to go and show the rest of the tribes how it's done. If you gain victory, the rest of them will be motivated to go up and also fight. And he says, in perfect tense, 
I have already given it to you, into your hands. So you go up and take. It is now, we cannot sit down, sit, sit around and say, oh, now the senior pastor is not there to nag on us or yell at us, I can't just do whatever. No, we have, we have to be the ones now to yell at ourselves. We have to be more mature now and say, okay, we need to wake up and get this going. We cannot wait for, wait for something to happen or some other person to come up and, and lead us. We need to wake up and grow up and we need to make, take this book, this, this, this Bible and this Gospel and go forward. I don't know if you have caught up and already gotten the hint, but this is a conclusion. Joshua, the name Joshua is the Hebrew, Hebrew version or Jesus. Yeshua, right? It's the same name. After, if this is the judge, time of the judges is talking about after Joshua's time, after Joshua left. The 12 tribes needed to go out and conquer the land. After Jesus left, there's 12 disciples that are remaining. They were feeling lost, they were feeling afraid, but Jesus, Jesus said, remain here in Jerusalem until you receive the Holy Spirit. Then you go out. What did the disciples do? They went out all different ways. And when they went out, after receiving the Holy Spirit, they conquered those different, different people. Peter's, Peter preached and 3,000 people converted, 5,000 people converted. That's the conquest. That's what happened. The, in the time of the judges, they did not do it correctly. But in the time of Jesus, they did it. What's the difference? They, received, they waited and they received the Holy Spirit. They were ready now. But during the time of the judges, everybody was too right. They did, everybody did what is right according to their own sight. Everybody just followed what they actually wanted to do, basically. Their own, they had their own agenda. Today, as we have to go out and go forth with God's, with the Gospel, do we have our own agenda? Are we doing it according to what I think, what we, each of us think is right? Or are we trained correctly to understand what is the right way? And in order for us to be able to discern, we need the Holy Spirit. Everybody needs to become a leader. I'm not saying everybody needs to be, be the head but everybody needs to be the runner now. Take the banner and run. And how do we become that leader that God can use? The leader that God that can actually do what God thinks is right, rather than what I think is right. Let us think about how God picks His leaders. And I pray that Everyone here will be the leader in the end time that God will pick. Let us think about two people, one, per, one, one from each testament. Old Testament, let us think about Moses. What did God have to do to Moses to make him a leader? God had to wait until he became 80. Why? Is God dumb or stupid? Because 80, if, he had call, if, if God had called him at 40, God could have done so much more. Moses was so much stronger, so much faster, so much more zeal. 
So why did he have to wait until 80? Because Moses was ready, right? Moses was ready to become the leader of the Israelites at 40. And he even attempted. But why did God let him go run away to the wilderness of Midian and wait there for 40 years? What do you think, if you were Moses, what do you think you would be like after 40 years of living in the wilderness of Midian, tending flocks? To be honest, I'd be depressed. I, I, I would have long hair, long mustache and beard, you know, drinking away. Forget about my life, I don't care. I, I used to want to do something and God put me out in the wilderness, out in the boondocks, and I've been waiting, waiting, 40 years, and I'm old, I'm old, I'm just gonna drink away and die. <clears throat> to be honest, I would, I would really, really feel like that. But God was waiting for Moses to do that. God was waiting for Moses to give up all his ambition and all his zeal, even lose his strength, and think, I am not able. He beat up that, that Egyptian and that Israelite because he, beat up, because he was zealous. Because he thought he was going to do something. God waits until the vessel is clear and clean. Any human agenda, human zeal, human greed or ambition, he waits until it goes away. God has all the time he needs. He's been waiting 6,000 years now. He can wait more. He, he's going to wait for us until we say, God, really? I don't care anymore. As long as you can use me, I'll be available. In the New Testament, Apostle Paul Talk about zeal and, and fervency to do God's work. You know he was persecuting the Christians because he wanted to do God's work. He thought that was the right way to do God's work. And I guess this time God did not want to want, wait. So he struck him. With bright light. He blinded him. And he went through the fast way. And he allowed Saul to give up everything. And we can hear, we, we know Apostle Paul's confession. I had everything. I had the education, I had background, I had my my pedigree or, or my family line, I had the I had money, I had the, the citizenship, I had everything. But I consider all of that rubbish. This is Philippians chapter 3, right? I consider all that rubbish. He emptied himself. Basically, all that rubbish in him, he threw away. And he became a clean vessel. And that's when God started to use him. After that, I mean, I think I mentioned that before. It would have been great for God to use Apostle Paul's citizenship, background, you know. He was a, a, a rabbi, he can use his title, status, he can use everything. But God, didn't, God chose not to use any of that. And Paul's status was zero, credit line zero, right? And he lost all his connections and friends, no more. And his looks, his eyesight, his health, all gone. Then God started to use him. So we cannot say, oh, because I'm, I'm not healthy enough, or because I'm too old, or because I cannot see so well, because I cannot, I don't know computers. All that excuse, God says, it's rubbish. God says, I want a clean vessel. Now we are living in a world in a, in a time 
that is very similar to the type of the judges. If we're not careful, we'll bounce right back to the old sinful ways or ways of the world. In this time, who's going to be the, the one that will stand properly? Who's going to be the one that will be able to tell what is right from what is wrong? Who's going, who's going to be the one that will say, okay, I'll pick up, I'll go and fight the Canaanites. I pray that everyone here will be that warrior, will be that, that vessel that God has been waiting to use. In the Bible, in God's, term, God's book, there's only two sides. His side, or not his side. So it's either this or that. There's no middle ground. Middle ground. So I pray that everyone here who make up our mind, which one, which side am I going to be? Am I going to be a little bit relaxed, a little bit more comfortable, like Pastor Sam when? <laughs> very, very ashamed to share with you and confess to you what I, I went through. I, of course, I repented and now I'm here. But, but to to be honest, when the when physically, when when the the you know the great lion behind your head, always watching over you, is gone, you feel like oh wow, relax a little bit. But then that relaxation. <laughs> That easiness hunts you down. And that caused me to slide away for a while. And so we need to always wake up and say, okay, we're not, we're, we cannot, I cannot blame anybody. I need to wake up and I need to be the Joshua. I need to be the Moses. I need to be the apostle Paul. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for allowing us to reflect upon the situation in the book of Judges. How lost the people were. And how sinful the, the times were. And Father, we can completely relate our life to and our, our environment to this. But Father, we, just because we cannot see Jesus with our eyes, just because we cannot see you with our bare physical eyes, doesn't mean that you are not here. It doesn't mean that you are not alive. And so Father, help us to be more alert and awake spiritually. And help us to be sensitive to what you need in this time. And Father, please allow us, just like Apostle Paul said, to even beat our bodies to, to obedience so that we can get up from our laziness, so that we can get up from our sickness, so that we can get up from our, our darkness and, and depression, and start walking forward with the banner of your word, with the, with the gospel in our hands, to fulfill your will. And it is, you have left it to, the, to each of the tribes to finish that final work. Likewise, you gave to the disciples to finish what Jesus has started. And we, we believe in this end time you have given to each and every church and each and every one of us to finish your work of the end time. So Father, help us to be the ones that will take up this task and go forward and fulfill it. Give us that motivation, give us that zeal, and but Father, not human zeal, but yours. Your with your fervency, with your zeal, and with your wisdom, help us to go forward. Help us, help each and every member of Zion Church and everyone here to become a clean vessel that you can use in the same time.
Thank you so much, Father, for your grace. With thankful hearts, we lift up this offering to you. We pray that you may receive and may your name be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.